Hello and um, welcome to Points of Clarity, the CMO interview series from Clear MNC Saatchi. Uh, my name's Garant Jones and I'm Clear's Global Marketing Director. Uh, broadcast live on Zoom, LinkedIn and YouTube, each interview covers one topic, uh, features two people and in just three short questions aims to deliver total clarity. Um, in each episode, I'm joined by a senior brand and marketing leader to discuss how they manage the often chaotic world of modern marketing. And we do it in about 30 minutes, so it is really rapid. Um, and this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Evans, uh, Managing Director of Marketing and Digital at Direct Line Group, and also Chairman of the School of Marketing, amongst many other bits and pieces. So welcome to the show, Mark. Great to be here, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Super. We'll be chatting about the growing talent crisis in modern marketing at both ends of the profession. Um, but a bit, bit, a bit more about Mark now. So Mark's an executive level marketer and non-exec director with several side hustles. And at Direct Line, he has responsibility for brand, comms, CRM, insight, digital and data across the brand portfolio. He's also exec sponsor for the BAME element of DLG's DNI activity and also sits on the board of DLG Legal Services. Um, as well as all of that, he serves as non-exec director of Learn et al, uh, an ed tech business. He's chairman of the School of Marketing, which we'll talk about, I know, later. Chairman of the Advertising Association, Front Foot, and uh, co-host of Other Places Will Go web show, which uh, again, I think we'll talk about in a bit. Um, he also, in amongst all of that, managed to found something called Sprinterthon in 2016, which seeks to uh, beat cancer faster and has raised over half a million to date for Stand Up to Cancer, which is a hell of an achievement. Um, he's also a fellow of the Marketing Society and of the Marketing Academy, both things I think we're going to talk about in this conversation, and has been recognised as the Financial Services Forum Marketer of the Year in 2015, Marketing Society Leader of the Year in 2018, and in Campaign's Power 100 Hall of Fame. So, Mark, now I've built you up, let's get down to business. Um, yeah, I want to talk, very, very kind into it. Yeah, <laughs> I want to talk to you first about the two different types of talent crisis that we've seen emerging in marketing right now. Um, I mean, at one end of the career ladder, we see potentially a lost generation of future marketing talent. It's one that you've been quoted in Marketing Week as saying is a, is a modern day tragedy. Um, you know, the idea that marketing talent could be forced into other industries through a, just a, a sheer lack of opportunity. Can you talk to me a little bit about the scale of the challenge as you see it and, and what you see as the underlying issues causing it? Yeah, happy to. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to say hello to Emma Winston and also James King. If that's the James King I know from back in the day of Mars. Great to, <laughs> to see you of sorts, James. Um, yeah, a modern day tragedy. Well, I mean, let's start from the fact that many people fall into marketing as a happy accident. Um, and I think it really starts there. I was uh, destined for a career in finance, actually, and um, deferred it for a year to do a sports present at university. And during that year, my graduate job disappeared in a puff of smoke. Uh, and it was you know, a bit annoying that the graduate job I had intended disappeared. Uh, and it was only then that I pivoted and thought maybe marketing was something for me. And then I've had a happy career uh, on the back of that. But for many people, they don't really know what marketing is all about, um, don't know how to get in. It's been described as a very closed uh, sector. And, and, and even more so for, pe for young people today, and particularly from uh, people from a more diverse background. And I, you know, I've just got a couple of stats which says that it's expected that uh, by the end of this year, uh, unemployment for 18 to 29 year olds is going to hit 17 percent which is, hasn't wow. been since 1984 but I, th I think it's just a hard industry for people to understand where wh where they might fit how to get work experience um you know and even, even to understand understand what marketing is and of course the reality is we all know everyone on this uh, will know it's a brilliant career um it's a career which thrives during volatility it's a career where you're bringing the outside in and the future forward so there's a huge gap between the possibility of having amazing careers and the fact that it's, get, it's hard and getting harder to get into. So we, we can talk about the Mentoring Gen Z initiative, but that really gets my goat because, um, you know, I'm all about helping people to achieve their full potential. And what I said in the article was that I think a lot of people are just kind of settling uh, rather than striving. And that, <laughs> frankly, that really annoys me. So. I'm quite passionate about this as a subject because not, not least uh, because, um, you know, so many people are, are going to be forced down to roads that don't allow them to achieve their full potential. Yeah. Is it an issue with the sector not being easy enough to understand for people to get in? I know there's been some lovely initiatives that have started to come out in terms of demystifying. It. I mean, there's open house by our sister company. Uh, MNC Saatchi London that's now gone to Australia, to MNC Saatchi Australia, which is designed to sort of help people to understand the different ways in which they could enter the sector. Is it a, is it a, 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 is it a sense of uncertainty about where you'd enter through or what it's all about? Or is it, is it just, 
you know, that's settling for something that's easy to understand? Well, I, I think this is a really good question. It runs quite deep. I do a bit of um, work in schools just to sort of help promote the, the profession uh, and, and haven't got, got started yet because of COVID, but joined speakers for schools. But I mean, I, I think generally the profession is misunderstood. We're not very good at marketing, marketing. <laughs> and it's not just to people who have yet to start on their careers. I'll just tell you a little story, um, if you indulge me for a moment. I was uh, at one of the last meetings I had before we all went into lockdown was with somebody rotating into the marketing function as part of the graduate scheme. A uh, trained accountant had been in procurement in their first placement. And I asked them, what did they, how did they feel about coming into marketing? And the person was a bit sheepish and said, uh, well, the thing is, I was quite nervous because I was rubbish at drawing at school. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he, he did quite a good save, which was, you know, but I've been really surprised at how data driven it is. But, you know, the default to marketing is advertising and fluff. Mm and non-commercial. I think it doesn't, doesn't have a great reputation, uh, particularly as the youth generation are possibly more anti-advertising, not, not, not universally, but you know, more ad blocking, a higher bar of what's gonna get their attention. And so here we are, people thinking that the profession is about drawing. Mm, yeah, it's that, it's that sort of all pervasive and, and quite dangerous commentary around you know, being the colouring in department that still you hear. And you really shouldn't anymore, because, as you say, it's probably the most data driven part of the profession. I mean, if I just go back to, you know, our chaos to clarity study from earlier in the year, you know, CEOs see marketing as having the ability to speak all the languages from finance through data, through technology into operations and then out into the market about the consumer. So the reality is very different, especially in the more sophisticated marketing departments in the world than perhaps the, the sort of there's perhaps a bit of a perception lag going on that's really impacting both recruitment and, and potential progression. It, it, it does go all the way up to the fact that the CMO is the least trusted in the C-suite. Uh, I think one or two in 10 CMOs, CEOs trust their CMOs, whereas eight, in, eight to nine to 10 trust their CFOs. So there's, it's, it's pretty endemic um, with lots of upside, shall we say, to be, to be positive. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the other end of the scale, because as part of Chaos to Clarity, um, we identified a problem affecting this sort of mid-senior end of the marketing talent spectrum. Um, I think the stat was 80% of the senior marketers we surveyed told us they're more likely to exit the profession than to push on and become the CMOs. And perhaps it's that trust thing. But many of us, that, um, many of them told us that actually they look at alternative general management roles. So they look to rotate to get another interesting kind of uh, capability set. And actually we spoke to a lady called Emma Letchford, who's now um, CMR Agribriefing uh, at the end of last year, who actually did do that. She went into IT general management to get a better understanding of the data side of the business and then rotated back into a marketing role. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is, you know, turning to startups because they kind of want to reconnect with the actual job that they enjoyed, you know, five years ago when they were actually doing the marketing and not necessarily in the situation they are now, perhaps doing more of the management. Um, or actually they, they sort of said, oh, well, actually, I think consulting might be quite interesting um, to go and get a broader and more varied experience. Is this something you recognize in your own team? Is it something that uh, you see it direct line and more broadly in the, in the industry and and what do you think is contributing to that sort of potential drain of talent at that senior end yeah it's a it's a good observation i think it's it, you know, it gets a bit rarefied that's probably true of all professions to some extent and, and you know in, in all these things you've got to own your own destiny and so people will find their way yeah. and none of those options you talked about sounded bad uh, just just different and um but you'd, you'd hope that we do, do have a strong pull through to the senior positions that keeps you know, the, the pipeline and keeps uh, marketing at the, the top of the agenda. But um, you know, I, I, I think that um, there, there is something about the reputation of, of marketing in the C-suite and um, it's often not the top job. And so for people who want to get on boards and excos, that's, that's definitely a thing. Um, there's also, um, it's a funny one because the first two years is when it's, it's sort of a bit of a sliding doors thing. So I, I'm in my job for nine years and I've done uh, a couple of jobs a bit longer and a couple of jobs a bit shorter. And it is a bit sort of polarizing between the first two years is a bit survivalist. <laughs> um, you need to show an impact. I, I heard the average tenure is something like 19, 20, 21 months. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, and you, but you don't really get to the good stuff. And then, but if you get through that, 
hurdle, then all you can reap the rewards of the seeds that you've sown and you've got some longevity in your team and you've built the team you want. And so I've seen it getting better and better and better. Um, but there's some, a lot of people who don't get to survive and then, then it becomes the sort of the rapid churn. And you know, I, I say to people who join the marketing team at Direct Line, you know, you, you, it's the best possible time you could have joined. And then I say, I'll be, be honest with you, that's my, my guilty secret is I've been saying that for the last nine years. But it's always been true when I've said yeah. it, because these things do grow and augment. And okay, you know, you've got to stay fresh and keep learning. But it's an interesting one. I think a lot of people maybe get turned off by the fact that it's pretty rapid churn, and and we'll be reading that average tenure is pretty low. So it's yeah. uh, it's it's just perhaps not for the faint-hearted. But as I said, that will be true of of many many professions, perhaps. Yeah, it's it's interesting because there are stats that that support this, and there are stats that sort of make you question it. I mean, there's. The stuff that tells you that, as you say, this is the turnover is 19, 20, 21 months at CMO level, that there's, there's the this lovely statistic you mentioned at the beginning of, you know, 80% of CEOs not trusting their CMO. But then our own study where we went out to, I think it was 700 chief execs and, and chief marketing officers and like, you know, the CEOs strongly came back to say that marketing was now, for them, the second most influential seat at the table in the boardroom, um, just after the CFO, interestingly enough. Um, so the most trusted and least trusted next to each other in terms of influence. Um, yeah. I mean, just the, the, you can get hung up on titles, but is it chief marketing officer, chief innovation officer, chief, whatever it is. But I think mm. the chief growth officer is the, um, you know, the, maybe the latest flavor of the month. But in the end, if the marketing team isn't focused on how to grow the business, then what is it doing? So yeah, I don't think you need the G in your title to, to figure that one out. Um, because, and it's growth is getting more and more elusive, elusive. Yeah. Um, for, for big companies with a bit of legacy um or exacerbated by covid of course but uh yeah i mean ceos should identify you know, finance folks don't grow businesses um marketing folks can grow businesses uh so yeah i can i can understand that but i think there's still a bit of a lag I, i'm fortunate i've worked for a number of marketing ceos who kind of intrinsically get the value of marketing mm. first time now working for uh, a cfo turned ceo in credit to Penny, she's done a lot of reverse mentoring, being happy to be educated and learn to really understand what the nuts and bolts of marketing are, because it mm. is frankly, frankly new to her. I guess if you worked for senior senior marketers who've become CEOs, in, in some respects, that's even more intimidating because they know they know what the what good looks like in the job intrinsically and they know how to challenge you. I guess that must have been quite a, um, a quite a kind of a, an education in and of itself. Yeah, I suppose I always grew up with that there in Mars that, you know, everybody was a marketer, really. I mean, all the juicy positions were held by people who come through the marketing stream. It was just sort of that sort of company. And I think if it is the same James King, uh, you know, he, he'll know that as well. Um, yes and no. I mean, I suppose it's about making sure you fight to have the, the, the freedom and space to do your job uh, and be really clear on the tram lines of when you do and don't want help. James. Hi, James. It is, it is the James. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story uh, of that I, Paul Geddes won't mind me telling it because he's told it himself. But when we did the 2014 relaunch of the Direct Line brand with the fixer, Harvey Keitel, Winston Wolf, there, there, there was a moment, um, a, a big wobble. I mean, there's a hundred reasons why it nearly never happened. Thankfully, it did. But we were two weeks, two, three weeks from being on air. And uh, we were having actually a culture session at the agency. And uh, Paul asked to go for a walk around the block. And this is very un-Paul. And so we did and we got around once and you know pausing the conversation i said well you know what's what's happening here what you know what what what, what do you want paul um and uh he said well the thing is i'm just not sure about this advertising you know he's quite old he's a gangster and we've had problems with celebrities which is very true as an organization we've had problems with celebrities over the years um so it started quite soft uh, i'm just not sure and you know if there's any reason that we shouldn't you know it would be okay i mean in fact if if it's not the right thing to do i'll back you we'll get it through the board we'll start again you know in the end i'd respect you more if we didn't do this and so he's gone from soft to he really <laughs> really doesn't like it and i remember thinking i've got two options here one is to say look well uh, we don't have a plan b and i knew that was going to be a disaster disaster because that's what ceos do they create all the, the room and oxygen for alternatives and you know re recovery plans and whatever it is I knew I had to just be hold my ground and you know, use some logic, but also use the all the accumulated trust I'd had in, uh, from him to make sure that he would step away and let us get on with it. 
and to his absolute credit, he said a number of times, it's probably one of the best decisions he made or didn't make. Um, because that then catalyzed the great turnaround that we had and some of the performance that underpinned his results uh, is, uh, is during his time as CEO. So I think you've got to, sometimes you've just got to fight for your mm. space, uh, however that, that shows up. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think you've got to get into a place of, um, of looking at the, the, the situation you're in and, and, and applying the experience you've got to make it work. Sorry, my dog has decided that right now is the best time to start barking at somebody coming down the path. Um, the question I have for you is um, now we've sized the problem and, and sort of said that there are these two twin challenges. What can we do to address them? You know, how can I mean, I, I love the mentoring scheme that you've, you've already talked about in the press. How can we create a more diverse and, and broadly talented marketing workforce? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I mean, this very much links to the DNI agenda, um, first to say, uh, and that would be true of both ends of the spectrum and all the way in between in terms of making sure we've got the richest, fullest, most diverse pipeline of talent top to toe, very specifically in terms of young folks. So, so the best kept secret in the world kind of is, um, is apprenticeships. Um, the fact that businesses can get almost 100% funded if they're less than 50 employees, if they've got an annual wage bill under 3 million, 95% funded, and many companies over 3 million uh, salary bill paying a whack into a levy that they never access and they're just seeing it as a tax. So the underutilization of apprenticeships is the big one. And within that, people think of apprentices and they think of bringing new, new people, new bodies into the organization as opposed to the upskilling of current. So I think we kind of need a bit of a reset on what apprenticeships can bring. But it's, as with many things, that's great, but you, know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, companies don't know this, but people don't know the opportunities around apprenticeships. So uh, as, as you mentioned, what we're focusing on mentoring Gen Z uh, through the School of Marketing is to create the biggest mentoring network in the UK, um, full stop. Uh, and that's to get people who've been around and know their way around to help age 16 to 27, 28, um, to f figure out their path forward. And that might be how to thrive whilst I'm already in, but also people just have got the seed of an idea they heard somebody that was working in marketing and they were curious, but basically to just give great advice, because I think people talk about mentoring or coaching, but in the end, they're all different forms of just getting some advice yeah. and some stimulus. Um, so we started that initiative and, and um, you know, if anybody did want to get involved as a, as a mentor, it's maximum a day a year. And um, we're hoping to help many thousands of people yeah. just have a better consideration of what's, what's open to them. Um, I'm sure there'd be plenty of people watching and, and, and who will listen in future on, 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 um, on, on, on YouTube. I, I think there'd be plenty of people who'd want to get involved. How would they do that, Mark? How do they, how do, they do that? Do they get contact with you? How, what's the best way? Yeah, I mean, there's, so on the School of Marketing website, there's a place for people to sign up. Also, I'd encourage if you've got people in your team or friends or families, so the mentees, that's an easy sign up. Uh, you can also just contact us through the School of Marketing website. So super dead easy and, and build that exchange. And, and uh, you know, I, I love it because this is you know, getting your hands dirty a bit in terms of how do you build the supply and demand of an exchange? Um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're scrappy at the moment, but we think it's got huge potential. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it is, a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Cause I think it's something I've done. I've, I've been, I've been both a mentee and a mentor um, through the last sort of 20 years. And, and I think it's one of the most powerful things you can have if you get a good mentor when you're early in your career, it can really help you to understand different ways and different perspectives, just because of the experience they're able to bring to the table, which you just don't have that you don't see because you've not, you've not, you've not done it yet. Yeah, I do. I do have a slight um, hypocrisy is the wrong word, but more generally about the sort of the purest version of mentoring as it's commonly described. I do have a little bit of a downer about to be, to be straight with everybody. Uh, in terms of we've probably all practiced the face of how do I respond when somebody says, please, 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 will you be my mentor? And you're thinking, uh, well, I'm really busy. I don't really know them. I don't want to offend them. I don't know if we'll have chemistry. I don't know if I'm staying. I don't know if they're staying. And am I going to be good at the things that they really want to know about? Um, so the, as I said, it's all forms of advice, but the, the mentoring Gen Z is dollops of advice. Um, yeah. And it's, it starts out as sort of one to 15. Um, more generally, I try and supplant the notion of having a mentor for a long period of time with a notion of building a virtual board of advisors. Uh, uh, the people that you go to to have a, a quite a specific conversation 
rather than one person's going to have the answer to everything. And this came from the reflection that when people come to talk to me for sort of mentoring advice, I basically turn it around to the thing that I like talking about, uh, regardless of what they come into as a brief. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so, um, yeah, but the thing is, you know, you already know you go to that person and have that type of really good conversation. So they are already on your virtual board of advisors. And then you can go around and it's like, who's the best person to have that type of conversation with? And the thing about it is the, the value exchange is, is sort of much, much easier, much, much more liberated because you're going, I say, Garen, I, you know, you did a fabulous webinar the other day. I'm thinking of setting one up. Um, I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Can I buy you a coffee? Or can I have a 20 minute Zoom? You're going to say yes, as opposed to bunny and headlights, Gareth, please, 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 will you be my mentor? <laughs> exactly. it, it, it's sort of um, you know, a fed, federated mentoring, I think it's just much easier for everybody. And you'll talk, you'll talk for 20 minutes about something that you enjoy and you're good at mm. effortlessly and feel good about it. Yeah. Uh, and you've, you've, you've never used the M word. It's just yeah. buy your coffee. It's quite similar to sort of the the sort of non-exec director thing, I guess, in a lot of ways, where you have a specific skill that you're, you, you're brought into to talk at a specific amount, for a specific amount of time about, and that there are other non-execs with other capabilities that cover off the other elements when, a, when you build a good non-exec board. Yeah. So it's, it's a nice model. I really like it. Um, let's talk about other... I do have a PowerPoint, which has got 25 seats on, which has got the names and the, you know, some of them know they're on. <laughs> <laughs> there you uh, go. Others don't, but anyway, sorry. That's no, it's good. I mean, there are other initiatives out there. I think what we've got, we've sort of strayed into the last question, really, but that's fine. I mean, that, that last question about other initiatives. I mean, we've got a few that, I mean, at Clear, we, we're partnering with Creative Access to change the ways in, way, in which we recruit diverse talent at the junior end of the spectrum. But then I guess at the, the more senior end, there are fantastic things like um, the Marketing Academy program, which I know you've, you've gone through yourself and been a Marketing Academy fellow that Cheryl and Shackle and the team run. I mean, there are some really good things in the industry that people are doing. I mean, have you got any other examples that I've not, I've not kind of come across yet? Yeah, well, I mean, a few things have caught my eye. Uh, so you, people have seen that Amazon have said that they're going to create a thousand apprenticeships uh, this year and give at least 50% of those people jobs. So there's, you know, big organizers, big successful organizations are finally waking up to apprenticeships, which is good. Uh, only yesterday, Publicist Group UK launched their open, um, uh, open apprenticeship scheme. I think they're trying to get 10,000 people through particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, giving them real, real coaching and advice, working on real briefs, real skills development, um, work experience and jobs boards and so on. So I, I wanted to do a big shout out um, to the publicist scheme, which launched yesterday. And again, people can, can get involved in that. Um, at the other end of the scheme, I think the Marketing Academy, and I, I, am, I feel like I'm a product of the Marketing Academy, um, they're just launching their scholarship scheme for people who are maybe uh, five to ten years in, I think it is. Um, I know a few people, including Richie Meta, who was the co-host for, the, um, for the, 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 the web show that we do. He went through that. And then the fellowship, which is CMO to CEO, 18 people a year, brilliant course. That really catapulted my thinking and self-awareness that's helped me ever since. So, I mean, I think there's lots of things. But the biggest thing I'd say is in yourself and in your teams encouraging a growth mindset. Uh, fabulous book, Matthew Syed, Rebel Ideas. Actually, she's done a few. Um, but just in, intrinsically, you either have a fixed mindset or you have a growth mindset. Uh, and creating a culture and inspiring others to have a growth mindset, I think is so important because the opportunities are out there, but you've got to have your radar up and have that curiosity. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of life imitating art, imitating life. Marketers need to be curious uh, because that's their profession. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there's a natural selection here, but curious people grow and get find the opportunities and succeed. But, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. So it's good to good to signpost these things. And I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Yeah. And thank you. I mean, it's it's been a really good conversation. I think we've covered uh, uh, surprisingly to me. I think we, we, we bit off quite a lot to chew and, and there is a lot more depth we could go into over a much longer period of time. But I think we've covered quite a lot. I think um, for me. It sounds and feels like people are starting to take both of these challenges more seriously, but there is much more to do. And I think what's good to see is things, things like the um, the open apprenticeship schemes and the and the and the need to be more engaged. I mean, the other thing that that, that I've picked up on is the Kickstart scheme, which is sort of related to apprenticeships that again no one seems to be using, despite it in effect being you know free money to bring talent into your business and get them engaged with doing a fantastic job in whatever part of the business you have but it's an opportunity for people who 
you know, the number of times I've sat inside meetings and, and heard people go, oh, I just don't have the team at the moment. There's just not enough space. That actually there is, there is, there is a way of getting around that, it, particularly for, for giving people the ability to prove their worth and, 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 and find out which, which path they want to take. So I think, I think there's a lot of good stuff. I think there's more that we can be doing. And I think everyone hopefully who's, who's signed in will agree that it's been a really fascinating chat. Um, so thanks so much, Mark, for taking the time to talk with me today. Tell you what, I, I'll give you one minute on Will's question if you want. How's oh yeah, you? sure. I've not seen that. Good spot. Um, so um, great question, Will. So best boss I ever had, Bruce and Cole, global CMO of Mars, and um, you know achieved so many things. But he, he always used to say, time and time again, uh, curious curiosity is the number one skill for any marketer. It all flows from there, bringing the outside in, bringing the future forward. And he used to say very specifically, there is always an insight lurking around the corner waiting to be discovered that can transform a brand a business even a sector uh, or a person um you just got to be curious enough to find it and i have seen a few times over in my career that actually the, the core insight of the category has been walked past for decades <laughs> um fixing an insurance who'd have thought i mean no, everyone was talking about price for 20 years um, it, it's often hiding in plain plain sight you just got to be curious enough to find it but Curiosity is very different to IQ. It's not innate. It is trained, and it's but it starts from the desire to get under the skin of what makes people tick. Yourself, your staff, your customers. I think it's just a hunger to learn, and it absolutely links to the growth mindset. Curiosity is not a DNA-defined thing. It's all links to mindset and um, and openness to learning. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's a lovely way to finish. Um... Uh, just to let everybody know, Points of Clarity continues on March 10th uh, when I'll be interviewing Tom Fishburne, Fishburn, better known to everybody here, I think, as the marketoonist. Uh, we'll be talking about his creative process and also how he came to be involved in our From Case to Clarity project, um, which you can download on our website. Um, next week on March 3rd, we'll be hosting a clear conversation, which is our panel series on the topic of making sense of the big shopper shift. So if you can say that quickly, I'll give you I'll give you a tenner. If you're in retail or FMCG, I think that's one you should really look to check out. And again, go onto our website, go to our LinkedIn page and sign up for those. I think we've got about 250 marketers signed up for the second one. So that should be a big event. Um, and finally, please do share the rerun of today's chat with your friends, colleagues, connect and look out for more announcements in the coming weeks. Uh, thanks so much for coming along and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks again, Mark. See you soon. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye.